Welcome to An Architecture, episode 13. In this episode, we want to present a speech that I made at New Hampshire's Porcupine Freedom Festival, which is put on by the Free State Project. The title of my speech was Private Ownership of Public Space in Post-State Cities. Put that on a t-shirt. <laughs> yeah, the title was a bit dry and academic, but whatever, that's what it was about. So I thought at least the Post-State Cities part of you had a little, a little excitement to it. You had me at privatization. <laughs> So before we get into the details of your talk, let's explain what the Free State Project is all about. Free State Project was started a number of years ago uh, by a guy named Jason Sorens. He had written kind of a white paper proposing that libertarians should kind of get together and all agree to move to one place, specifically one state, and then start being activists there in that one state. So the thought is that once you get this concentration of people together, you can have kind of an outsized effect with your activism and political efforts. So the way they set this up, all it is is that they have this pledge that they want people to agree to. So the pledge says, I hereby state my solemn intent to move to the state of New Hampshire. Once there, I will exert the fullest practical effort toward the creation of a society in which the maximum role of government is the protection of individuals' right to life, liberty, and property. So that's a pretty broad definition, kind of open to interpretation. And that's intentional. It, it, it kind of makes this a broad umbrella for libertarianism, where it's not picking certain issues or, or a specific idea, you know, like anarcho-capitalism or something that people are working towards. It's this idea that people are getting together and doing what they think is right and what they think is best to promote the cause of liberty. Yeah, and as I understand it, I think there's a threshold of 20,000 pledges that once they get 20,000 people to sign up, then that's the trigger that within a certain period of time, everyone has to move to New Hampshire. Yeah, so once 20,000 people sign this pledge, they've all agreed to move to New Hampshire within five years. And just this past year, in 2016, they actually hit that number. They hit the 20,000 pledges. Oh, really? I didn't realize that. Yeah, and so over the next five years, at least in theory, a lot of these people should be moving to New Hampshire. I'm glad I've got a rental property there. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's the thing. Part of what motivated me to go and speak there is that I'm trying to start to network with a lot of these people. Because now that I've finished my travels with my family, which you can hear about in episode six, we're back in the States and I am in the process of starting out my own architecture practice. Oh my God, congratulations. <laughs> <laughs> so does this mean I can't go around calling you an unemployed grifter anymore? Well, let's see when I actually get a project coming in the door. <laughs> yeah, so I'm starting my own practice. It's called Adra Architecture. What's Adra? Is that A-D-R-A? What's that like? Architects drawing real architecture? Is it some sort of acronym or what? Yeah, right. Well, if you want, everybody can go to my website, www.adraarchitecture.com. And I have a blog post there titled, What Does Adra Mean? It's not an acronym. It's a word that I learned during my travels that uh, has become kind of meaningful to me as I'm now starting up this practice. So definitely check that out. You can see some of my projects I've worked on in the past and get a sense of the vision for my architecture practice. If anybody's in the New England area, I am focusing on Maine, New Hampshire, and Massachusetts, specifically on residential, commercial, and healthcare projects. My background is primarily in healthcare, but I've also done some residential and commercial projects. So the fact that there are now going to be 20,000 libertarians moving to New Hampshire, buying houses, possibly building houses, starting businesses, I thought it would be a really good idea to start to try to get to know some of these people. Because who knows, even if a handful of them want to come here and build a house or fit up a space for their business, I want to be the guy that can help them do that. So I did have this self-interested, profit-seeking motive here in, in going to Porkfest and presenting there. And I assume that you'll be sponsoring the podcast as soon as the money starts flowing in, right? At the moment, 100% of the proceeds from Adra Architecture are going to support an architecture podcast. Subject to revision terms and conditions apply. So one problem is that, of course, I'm not actually a Free State member. I did recently move, and we were looking in New Hampshire, we were looking in Portsmouth, but we ended up just across the river in Maine. And I'm so close that I can actually walk to New Hampshire from my house in about 15 minutes <laughs> and be in downtown Portsmouth. But we didn't quite make it into New Hampshire, so I can't in good faith sign the, the Free State Project pledge and, and say that we're going to move there. 
However, of course, Joe and I both grew up in New Hampshire. And I worked there for 13 years before I, I went off traveling with my family and, and I'm now starting my practice. And of course, I want to be working in New Hampshire. So uh, hopefully that's close enough for three staters <laughs> to feel that I'm, I'm you know, there and, and involved in the community. And I'm hoping that as people are coming here and looking for advice on kind of where to move to and what to do and how to, how to get involved, that hopefully I can be a resource for them. I guess if any of them want to move to Australia, they can call me. <laughs> Well, maybe that rental unit you have, maybe when that turns over, we'll see if we can get a free stater in there. Yeah, so we really haven't even had a chance to talk about Porkfest since you were there. I think I managed to get through to you at, on Skype at one point for about five minutes, but then you had to go jumpstart your car or something, so you hung up on me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So how did you line up the speaking gig? Well, they're pretty open to, to inviting speakers in. Um, this is a four or five day festival, and it's an outdoor festival. This is all kind of campsites and they have, I guess they have some hotel there and, and some cabins that you can rent. But most people are out there camping, which is what I did. And so it's this outdoor summer festival. Um, this is up in the White Mountains of New Hampshire on a campground. This is actually the 14th annual pork fest that they've had. And first of all, the reason they call it the Porcupine Freedom Festival is that the porcupine is the mascot and the logo for the Free State Project. And I think the idea there is that a porcupine, you know, is not an aggressive animal, but but if something attacks it, it, it defends itself or something like that. I think Kim Jong-il came up with a similar philosophy for North Korea. <laughs> well, he's a libertarian, isn't he? <laughs> Pretty much. So there are a lot of opportunities to speak there. You know, there are a lot of speaking slots. Although I was kind of late to the party. While we were in England, I realized that you know, this is something I should be looking into. I've always been interested in the Free State Project, and I always wanted to check out Porkfest. And now I really had a reason to do it, <laughs> both to promote the podcast as well as to promote my new business. So I looked it up in May and realized that it was at the end of June. So I really only had about six weeks if I was going to do this to pull it all together, pull a speech together. But I thought it was worthwhile. So I came up with the idea and kind of put together a summary of the speech in about 24 hours <laughs> and sent it off to them. And luckily, they still had some availability. And when they got back to me with the schedule slot, it was at 10 a.m. on the Friday of the event. And the way this goes is it kind of starts on Wednesday and, and more and more people come Wednesday, Thursday, and then Friday. And then, of course, Saturday is the biggest day. And so 10 o'clock on Friday, I thought was a pretty good spot. So I was surprised that they still had that open. Then, of course, I looked at the full schedule and realized that at the same time on Friday at 10 o'clock, Jeffrey Tucker was scheduled to speak on the main stage, you know, when I was kind of in the sideshow tent. Yeah. And what, and what was his, wasn't his topic like fight club or something like that? Yeah. Right. So, so we had, we had private ownership of public space, post state cities up against fight club yeah. by Jeffrey Tucker. Who's was a proper celebritarian. <laughs> right. Unlike us F listers. <laughs> so I said, oh, okay, all right, whatever. This is fine. I'll go up there. I'll, you know, I'll see if I, can, if I can steal some people away from, from Jeffrey Tucker. <laughs> <laughs> I thought about even putting a challenge up there on Twitter that if more people came to see my speech than went to Jeffrey Tucker's speech, that I would give my speech wearing a bow tie. Only a bow tie. So fortunately for me, although it was kind of unfortunate, a few weeks before the event, I noticed that Jeffrey Tucker's name had disappeared from the schedule. Now, I would have loved to have seen Jeffrey Tucker there. He had been scheduled to speak two days, so I could have seen him on Saturday. But at the same time, I was kind of glad that he dropped out for whatever reason, <laughs> um, because that hopefully freed people up to come and see my speech on Friday morning. Victory by attrition. I'll take it any way I can get it. <laughs> so how many people did actually come to your speech? I'd say I got about maybe 30 to 40 people who came. And some people kind of you know, came in and out for, for part of the speech. But yeah, it, it seemed like a pretty good crowd, especially it was actually pouring rain on Friday morning <laughs> when my speech started, although I think the sun came out by the end of it. So I was pretty happy with the crowd I got. And after the speech, I got to talk to a handful of people in the audience who had questions or comments or you know, just wanted to kind of continue the conversation. So that was really cool. And that was pretty typical of a lot of the events there that you know, after someone would speak, you could go up and talk with them about, you know, whatever the topic was. Everybody seemed to be pretty accessible to anybody who wanted to meet them. How many people were there all together at the whole festival? I think they say that they get around like 1,500 people there. Okay. So it's a pretty good size event. And a lot of these people are people who are Free State Project members, but who haven't made the move to New Hampshire yet. And so for a lot of them, 
they're coming here. They're trying to find out what it's like in New Hampshire, trying to understand how they can get involved and where they want to live and, and just what the whole movement is about up here. So what was the crowd like? I imagine that now that Trump's in office, a lot of the kind of people that want to end the state would be big time Hillary Clinton supporters. Is that the kind of crowd it was? Yeah, I didn't meet too many people who were with her. <laughs> But I will say that it was a, a very diverse group of people. You had maybe not quite Hillary supporters, but definitely kind of the, the bohemian kind of hippie you know, crowd. And this was a camping event. So that kind of thing is, is usually to be expected at these kind of outdoor festivals. Those guys were already there when it started. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You had kind of the tie-dye shirt wearing crowd. You know, then you also had like maybe the Texas ex-military guy with an assault rifle over his shoulder. <laughs> And then you had kind of the Bitcoin computer geek crowd there. Did you ask any of them how we can get people to donate Bitcoin to the podcast? Technology hasn't solved that problem yet. (laughs) Come on, guys, get to work. And then, you know, there were also some families there. They had some really cool events for kids, and, and there were just kids running around the whole time. Kids of all ages, young kids to up to teenagers. And then there were kind of business people and maybe more academic people. And what was really cool to see was that all of these, you know, very diverse people all just got along and, and talked to each other and were all very welcoming and, and interested in each other. And so you'd have, you know, the, the Grateful Dead tie-dye guy talking to the ex-military guy with a rifle. <laughs> and sometimes you'd even have like a, the Grateful Dead tie-dye guy with his own rifle. <laughs> <laughs> so this is the kind of big umbrella that I think libertarianism creates that once people get on board with the principle of non-aggression, then it really creates this common ground where it breaks down some of the perceived divisiveness where, you know, if you were out at some other political event and you saw some tie-dye guy talking to an ex-military type of guy, you'd probably just assume that they were on complete opposite ends of the political spectrum. And I'm sure that a lot of these people have different priorities that they're promoting. We often say that they might have different ends that they're seeking, but everybody agrees on the means of trying to achieve their goals without relying on the initiation of force. So what did you spend the rest of your time doing there? Well, besides giving my speech, I actually was a sponsor of the event for Outdoor Architecture. So I had a booth set up there just to get my name out there and possibly talk to people who were interested in coming to New Hampshire and building something. So for the most part, I hung around the booth because, you know, of course, I wanted to be available for people. But I did get out to a handful of other speaking events. So one I went to was a debate about zoning. Okay. And then, of course, I went to the keynote address, which was Patrick Byrne, who was the CEO of Overstock.com who turns out to be a principal libertarian. And I think he's speaking at, at Porkfest before. Yeah, so it was cool to hear him talk. There was another debate I went to about immigration, which is relevant to our, our episodes six and seven. Not, not to mention the episode that started as episode eight and is now episode who knows, <laughs> which we started months ago and haven't finished yet. Yeah, by the time we finish that episode, Trump will probably have already built the wall. <laughs> <laughs> Well, then we can do an episode about the wall. That's a built environment thing, right? <laughs> We're just waiting for Trump to give us more material so we can wrap up that episode. <laughs> Another speech I went to that I thought was really cool, uh, this guy named Dale Brown from an organization called, I think it's the Detroit Threat Management Task Force or something like that. We'll put it in the show notes. I only caught about the, the second half of his speech. I, I think he's like an ex-cop. He started this organization in Detroit. And they're essentially a security agency, so, so businesses, you know, office buildings um, can hire them to protect their property as, as a security. But they also do a lot of, of outreach and work in the neighborhood to try to diffuse situations and to try to work with the community to create what they call nonviolent outcomes from potentially confrontational situations. And so he's talking about, you know, what, ha- what do you do if you get into this certain situation? You know, how do you get out of it? How do you resolve that? peacefully. And I'm talking about, you know, a situation where some guy's got a gun to your head, you know, (laughs) how do you get out of that? And I mean, this guy was literally like, (laughs) so he gave this whole speech kind of talking about that. And then afterwards, he was like, holding court and like showing people like, like demonstrating all these moves you can do to get out of these situations. <laughs> and I mean, this guy, it's like, it's like Jason Bourne kind of stuff. And this is like, he's like a pretty big guy, you know, and he was, <laughs> the, the way this guy could move and, and kind of do all this stuff, it's like, I don't know, like jujitsu or something. <laughs> but that was really kind of eye-opening and, and entertaining. <laughs> and it wasn't just the, the physical stuff that he could do, but then he would talk about, okay, so this is what you do. You do this move, you know, and then now you've disarmed this guy. Now the guy runs away. And you got a gun in your hand. <laughs> now what do you do? You don't know if there are bodies on that gun or whatever. 
<laughs> and so then he talked about the whole you know then you know when do you call the cops what do you say to the cops you know right how do you deal with it you know legally and, and, and so he kind of thought holistically about all this stuff <laughs> uh it was really really kind of interesting yeah i'd love to i don't know maybe we'll try to get him on the show sometime to talk about protecting your home or protecting your facility or whatever i think he's been on tom woods before Probably, you know, yeah. of course he has, right? <laughs> in a thousand episodes or whatever that, that he's done. Uh, I'll try to dig that up and put it in the show notes if I can find it. Yeah, that was, that was one presentation that, that really stood out for me. And they did a lot of other events too, like they had a pig roast and they had... They had a burning porcupine, you know, kind of like Burning Man, <laughs> where they made some kind of little porcupine thing that they lit on fire. Then, of course, they had booths set up. So they had booths for activist organizations. Like, I was actually right next door to the New Hampshire Libertarian Party. <laughs> um, and there were some other businesses there, like mine, who were promoting their business. And, of course, they had people there selling food and, and selling other merchandise. So, yeah, so I set up my booth there. I called it the Audra Lounge. <laughs> Ooh, swanky. <laughs> yeah, since my speech was about public space. I was trying to create my own little piece of public space right there at Pork Fest. <laughs> so I had some inflatable couches. I had some camping chairs. You know, this is all under a little tent. And my wife, who's a graphic designer, had gotten some banners printed up for me. So I had the whole thing, you know, looking pretty good. You're talking about an architecture podcast banners, right? <laughs> I, what I did is I took, I, I did make a little business card <laughs> that had Audra Architecture on one side yeah. and an architecture podcast on the other side. Nice. Because I had built myself in the speaking slot as an architecture podcast, but then my booth was for Audra Architecture. So I wanted people to get the idea that, you know, I was, these are the two hats I was wearing. Uh, you're like Bruce Wayne. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> That's exactly right. I'm an architecture. I did actually have a number of people come by the site and, and actually had a handful of podcast listeners come by. Wow, so they all showed up. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So I want to thank every single one of our 12 listeners for showing up to Porkfest. Nice. But it's really cool for people to kind of recognize me as, oh, you're the an architecture guy. Or, <laughs> or if they hadn't listened to the podcast, some other people had at least heard us on Tom Woods. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I actually did have at least one person dub me a celebritarian for having been on the Tom Woods show. So, nice. So I'll take it when I can get it. That's right. <laughs> Making waves. That's right. <laughs> so did you leverage that status to meet any other celebritarians? Well, a bit. I, I did actually touch base with Brett Finot from the School Sucks Project, which is a podcast that you and I both like a lot. Yeah, it's great. I'm hoping to pitch an idea to him of maybe collaborating on an episode so, at some point. And then on your orders, Joe, I also hunted down uh, Steve Patterson from Patterson in Pursuit which is another podcast about kind of philosophy and libertarianism. Yeah, I've been following Steve Patterson for a while. And when I saw that he was going to Porkfest, I told Tim, if you see Steve Patterson, tell him I need to set him straight on the Copenhagen interpretation of quantum mechanics. <laughs> As you do. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, so I did run into him and I, and I offered up your challenge to him. So the gauntlet has been thrown down. You'll have to reach out to him and see if you can set him straight yeah well first i have to study up on my physics a bit more <laughs> i may have bit off more than i could chew there <laughs> <laughs> well it wouldn't be the first time that you shot your mouth off about something that you really have no idea about this is episode 13 so speaking of shooting your mouth off about something you have no idea about my speech <laughs> was about private ownership of public space in post-state cities so so there are really kind of three parts there the first was i wanted to talk about what public space is, why it's important, and specifically why libertarians should care about it. Of course, public space is meaningful to us when we think about the built environment, when we think about cities, urban spaces, things like roads and parks and other public facilities. Understanding public space is really key to understanding cities and the built environment in general. So this speech for me, I was really kind of scratching a few itches here. <laughs> One was trying to understand how public space could exist and function in a stateless society. And then also how we get from here to there, where we now have all of this space that is owned by governments, of course, roads and parks and nature preserves and all these kinds of spaces. And to address that, I had to talk about property ownership and property rights. And something that's always kind of bothered me about the standard libertarian ideas of property ownership is this idea that property has to come into ownership through homesteading. And so the problem with government property is that it hasn't been homesteaded really in a libertarian sense. So what happens when all this government property stops being government property? You know, what's, what's the mechanism and the process there for converting that to private ownership? And specifically, how does all that property become privately owned while maintaining its character as public space? And then finally, I wanted to talk about if we do get to some kind of a stateless society, what would the widespread ownership of public space mean for the development of cities? 
Yeah, so Tim was able to record his speech, and I have managed to clean up the audio quite a bit. It was a little bit noisy, given the atmosphere that he was in. There was a little introduction that we've cut out, just so we could jump right into the meat of the speech. One quick note on the speech as you're listening to it. I did present this as a slideshow, so I had a handful of slides up, and a lot of the slides had, as you'll hear in the speech, I'm kind of reading down through these lists of, of ideas. This whole thing was kind of a brainstorm of different ways of thinking about this and of defining some of these concepts. So I run kind of quickly through some of the points because everybody could see it up on the screen. But we'll have all the info from the slides in the show notes if you want to follow along. So here's Tim from An Architecture Podcast and Audra Architecture presenting Fight Club. I mean, the private ownership of public space in post-state cities. Okay, so the topic today, as I said, private ownership of public space. Um, This is a quick overview, and then I'll get into it. Um, I want to start by defining what public space is so that we all understand what it means to to have public space, to have access to public space, and what are some of the the rights associated with that. Um, Then I want to talk generally about ownership of land, some kind of basic principles of of property rights, property ownership, how land comes to be owned. Then talk about government property and um, potential means of divesting government property. Uh, again, the idea where we have a lot of public space that is owned by government, we have to understand how do we get from here to there? How do we take what is now government property and move that to a point where it can be um, owned by private organizations, non-governmental organizations? Uh, and then from there, I want to talk about specifically about ownership of public space. What are some different ways that public space could be owned and still re- retain its character as public space that's available to everybody? And finally, I want to talk about a little bit about how widespread private ownership of what is now public space, uh, what the implications of that could be for what I call post-state cities. If we get to some kind of um, stateless society where, where all this land is privately owned, what does that look like and what does that mean for our cities? Uh, so first of all, what is public space and why should libertarians care about it? Uh, this is a topic that uh, some libertarians have addressed over the years, but I think it, it probably hasn't gotten the attention that it's deserved. Um, I think it's, uh, as you'll see when we get into it, it covers a lot of ground. Um, and I think there have been kind of varying views and maybe conflicting views among some people who have written about it. Um, so I think it's a topic that's, that's worth thinking about and worth discussing for all of us. So this is my definition of public space. Um, I say that public space is space that is accessible to non-owners without invitation with some reasonable restrictions. Um, so generally, private space you need an invitation from the owner to come onto the space, otherwise you're considered a trespasser. Um, public space, we've turned that around a little bit. Um, generally, there's an expectation that you can enter and occupy a piece of property, if it's public space, um, without somebody trying to, to kick you off it. However, it's not a black and white issue. It's not like a space is either public or private. There are varying degrees of, of publicness or <laughs> varying degrees of how public or private a space is. So I, I've made a little list here. You have public, truly public space where you need no, no permission for entry, no permission for occupancy. This is something like a public park, you know, that might be open 24-7 that anybody can go to at any time. Um, and nobody's going to give them any trouble about that. Then I have what you call permissible public space where there could be public facilities that you need some initial requirements to enter. Like you may not have to pay a fee. They might, may have limits on how many people can come in or out of the space. Um, I noted here something like a movie theater, where anybody can, can go into a movie theater, but of course you have to buy a ticket to get in. Um, but I would still consider that a form of public space. Then you have w- permissible private space, which is, I'm saying, something like a corporate building lobby, where there's an expectation that it's okay for you to walk into that space, but you might not be able to get much farther than that unless you have a good reason to be there. And finally, private space, which is something like a private home, where um, most people don't have an expectation that they can just walk into anybody's house. Um, That truly is private space for people to access um, by invitation only. So we can break down some different categories and types of public space in the world around us. I've broken this down a few categories. We have open space, which is plazas and parks, what I call urban open space, natural areas like hiking trails, nature preserves, preserved farmland and beaches. Enclosed parks, like theme parks and amusement parks. And then certain kinds of buildings. Obviously, public space isn't just outdoor space. It's indoor space as well. 
So certain types of buildings like social and cultural facilities, museums, theaters, community centers, libraries, tourist attractions, sports arenas, what I call mercantile facilities, farmers markets, malls, shops, restaurants, transportation facilities, airports, train stations, bus stations. And then in addition to these, those kind of buildings, we have what I call pathways, which are things like roads and rights of way, ways to get from one place to another. You could even include waterways in that with rivers and lakes and oceans. And of course, every road ends in a parking lot. So I've included parking on there, uh, parking lots, garages, and, and even on-street spaces. As I said, there can be reasonable restrictions on public space, on access to public space. And I don't think that, that having restrictions on public space necessarily disqualifies it from, from being defined as public space. So first of all, you can have what I'm calling administrative restrictions, which are fees for use. You know, some even, of course, even government properties like state parks, um, often you pay a fee, you pay a little fee to get in, um, or maybe you pay a fee to park your car there. For roads, obviously, we all pay gas taxes, and that ostensibly goes to, to fund the roads. Um, but there are toll roads, and, and this is all, these are all things that aren't really a big deal for people. I mean, I, I think one of the big fears people have about privatizing public space is that all of a sudden you're going to have to pay money to go into all these spaces. But I would argue that in a lot of ways, we're already paying money um, to support these public spaces. Um, and even the idea of paying fees or road tolls aren't really that, that big of a deal. Most people um, are accepting of that and understand that, that it makes sense to pay some fees for your use of space. Another kind of restriction is, is hours of use. Again, a lot of public parks say something like from dusk till dawn, you can be there. Occupancy capacity. This applies more to, to indoor facilities. Um, a lot of buildings have limits on how many people can be there. Those limits are based on how they can safely egress people from the building. And obviously, any uh, parking lots have occupancy capacity, too. If once a parking lot's full for, for a space, then you can't have more people in. Different types of occupancy. Uh, parks and, and other types of public space uh, may limit the types of activities that you can do there, where you might not be able to just go and camp in your city park. Or you might not be able to set up a, a vendor booth or, or have an assembly function within in certain types of public space. Beyond those types of administrative restrictions, there could also be behavioral restrictions on, um, on public space. So again, this, this comes down to the property owner, which in, a, in the case of a lot of, of public space is government. But you could have restrictions in any public space on disruptive or aggressive behavior, public drinking, public drunkenness, things like that within, within public parks or public spaces. Um, obviously on roads, there are many rules that govern uh, how you can behave on roads, um, rules against reckless driving, speeding, running red lights, all that kind of stuff. Obviously criminality, some, certain types of events, you might have security at the door, letting people in to support events and things like that. Um, and, and then again, health and safety risks, as I mentioned, setting occupancy limits so that uh, people can come in. There, there could be public spaces. Might, might not be a popular thing here, but m there could be public spaces where people don't allow firearms in, things like that. So <laughs> getting some, some looks from the front row here. But, you know, as, as for private property owners, they are able to, to set some, some reasonable restraints on people accessing their, uh, their public space. So why is public space important? Really, it's, I see it as something that's essential to human functioning. If you imagine it, uh, the, the cities and the world around us without public space, it would be really hard to, to, to function, to get places you need to go, to get to your, the grocery store, to get to your job. Having public space gives people freedom of movement to get to, from one place to another on, on roads, as I mentioned. It provides space for markets um, where you have access to goods and services in stores and restaurants and shopping malls. It provides opportunities for recreation, access to nature and history and the arts, as well as spaces for social interaction, public discourse, protest, and celebration. Um, often these kind of things happen in public spaces. So to summarize this definition of public space, um, it is space that is accessible to non-owners without invitation with some reasonable restrictions. There are many types, as I mentioned, open space, buildings, and pathways. They can be government-owned and privately owned. Uh, the fact that a, a space is, is privately owned doesn't exclude it from, from being public space. In fact, a lot of the public space that we function in from day to day uh, is privately owned. Public space is not a black or white definition. There can be varying degrees of access um, with varying degrees of permissions and restrictions set by the property owners. Uh, 
And many private facilities even have public space components like a, like a public lobby in a corporate building. And really, even on private property, there's, there's some basic expectation of being able to enter a property. So even in a private home, most people have the expectation that you can go up and, and knock on the door you know, as long as it's not three in the morning and at least engage with, with the homeowner. And again, there can be reasonable restrictions on entry and occupancy in spaces, and I don't think that disqualifies it from being considered public space. And as I said, public space is essential to public life. So now I want to switch gears a bit and talk about ownership of land. And the reason here is that I want to talk about ways that that public space, the ways that public space is currently owned and ways that it can come to be owned as we move towards something more like a stateless society. I've defined here what I see as some essential elements of, of land ownership. The first is reasonable freedom from adverse use, inhibiting desired, uh, desired use. So the reason that we as a society agree to allow everybody to kind of cut up the land and, and, and parcel it out in these individual parcels for private ownership is that we all recognize that that's really necessary for people to do what they need to do on the land. If you're going to farm land, if you're going to build a house, you need to have some reasonable expectation that once you build a house that somebody else isn't going to move into it and kind of take it out from under you. And then another uh, important part there is the freedom to transfer ownership rights at will in whole by, by selling the land or in part by leasing it out to somebody for a period of time. I just talked about this a little bit, but the necessity of land ownership is essential, as I said, to build homes, to build roads and infrastructure with minimal risk of seizure, eviction, or adverse use by others. So what are the means that we enforce land ownership? There are a number of different ways to essentially keep people off your property and to keep them from, from doing things on your property that, that you don't want them to be doing. I've divided this up into a few different categories here. The first I call architectural means. As an architect, I, you know, like the, this, this is a priority for me. I call the architectural means things like fences and gates, walls and doors, and even things like intrusion alarms, which, which physically keep people from, from entering a property or at least make it really difficult for them to do so. And then, of course, we have legal means. So we have things like land titles, property deeds, declarations of trust, surveys that define the boundaries of properties and sometimes define the rights uh, of the property owners, liens, declarations of homestead, and then other, other elements of common law or, or local customs that that set forth the expectations that people have when they're coming onto a piece of property. And then, of course, finally, there are uh, forceful means of defending property against trespassers, especially threatening trespassers. So you can have some form of armed security. This could be, if you're in like a gated community, you might have a security um, agency that, that helps to, uh, to protect that, that whole property. Really, uh, the police uh, in a lot of places serve this role. They, they're not on your property, but if you have a problem, you call, you call the police and they come to your property and, and they deal with it. But then, of course, there, there is this idea of forceful eviction where homeowners can, can take matters into their own hands. We have to, you have to be careful there, of course, about when that, that is appropriate or when it isn't. But ultimately, private property owners often claim a right to to use forceful ev eviction as kind of a last resort against trespassers. And then finally, you could have booby traps. So, you know, if Joe Pesci uh, tries to come into your house at Christmas time, you might step on a roller skate and fall down a flight of stairs. So <laughs> let's, not, let's not rule that out. Right? That's, still, that's still on the table. So I want to talk about this idea here of a forceful eviction a little bit more, because this is something that I think is, is challenging for us as libertarians to think about and it's challenging for a lot of other people who aren't libertarians when we start to assert these, this, this kind, of, um, kind of idea. I have this quote here from the song Signs, you know, anybody caught trespassing will be shot on sight. I would argue that, that if somebody is coming onto a piece of property, that that act of trespass alone is not necessarily an act of aggression that would justify defensive force. I mean, obviously... If somebody's coming onto a piece of property and then they are threatening, as again, as if it's three in the morning and they're coming and banging down your door, there's a reasonable expectation that they're, they're posing some kind of a threat. But it really, if somebody's threatening you, it doesn't matter if they're on your property or not, you have the right to use defensive force. That really has nothing to do with whether you own, own the property or not. So this idea of, of using force to evict somebody from, from a piece of property, I think it's challenging for us to, 
to square off with the non-aggression principle, which says that, that we can't initiate force against people. One way we can, we can address this is we can say, well, okay, has the trespasser consented to force being used against them? You know, if somebody has a sign up that says, that says anybody caught trespassing will be shot on sight, does that mean that somebody coming onto that, that piece of property has consented to, to what the owner has, has put out there? And just to be clear, um, you're actually not allowed to shoot anybody who comes onto your property. You're allowed to put the sign up but as freedom of speech, but um, you can't just start, you know, <laughs> gunning them down. So I would say that, that any property right or somebody asserting a property right that gives them the right to forceful eviction, we do have this in society, but I think that we need to rely on local laws and customs. I would say that the right to use force to exclude or evict people from a certain area of land is not a, some kind of a priori natural right. I think that, that it's based in the principles of property ownership and that the principles of property ownership are based on kind of pragmatic needs of, of creating societies where people can be productive, where they can build things, where they can live in, in certain places with reasonable security um, uh, and expectations of, of privacy. So I would say again here that, that a right to force through eviction is a, a valid legal construct in societies with a broad consensus for property rights. So if you live in a society where you have an expectation of having and enjoying property rights, you should be willing to grant that to everybody else around you. But of course, anybody who wants to engage in, in forceful eviction needs to respect proportionality as well as, as due process. And again, all of that is defined within the, the local laws and customs. And the, uh, just to take note, the reason I'm talking so much about this, this concept of force of eviction is, of course, when we talk about public space, the way we're defining public space is public space is a place where you don't have this right, where you can't forcefully evict somebody from public space unless they, they break some of the, the kind of rules and restrictions that are established in that space, as I said before. So when we talk about this right of forceful eviction, it becomes really important to talk about how land comes into private ownership because this becomes really the justification for why people are claiming this right to, to essentially initiate force against people for coming onto that property. So there are a few different ways that, that we as libertarians often say that, that property can come into ownership. One is, is homesteading, which is this idea of mixing labor with the land. And I'm saying here that, that it's, it's a really nice idea, but it's, it's pretty impractical. If you think of what it takes to actually mix your labor, especially with a large area of land, I mean, you're talking about clear cutting or farming or, or doing some, you know, doing a lot of work on that land to get to the point where you can say, okay, now I've done this work on this land. Now I, I own it. I mean, it. To me, homesteading is valid, but it kind of comes after the fact once you've already established a claim for the land. This criteria, it also excludes the potential for natural preservation. So if somebody wants to go into a natural area and say, I want to preserve this the way it is, you know, they're not really mixing their labor with the land. So homesteading doesn't really, doesn't really help them there. So then there's another principle of land ownership, which is whoever has a first claim um, becomes the landowner. Um, I have this quote here from, uh, there's an old kids in the hall sketch where this guy's laying in bed and, and some other guy comes in and this Spanish kind of conquistador comes in and stabs him in the chest with a Spanish flag and says, I claim this chest in the name of Spain. <laughs> some reason I always think of that when we talk about land claims. A, a claim alone I see as something that's necessary to define a claim for a piece of land, but on its own, it's insufficient. Um, I have this example here. There's this guy named Dennis Hope who has actually claimed the moon. And over the years has sold off like thousands of dollars of claims to pieces of property on the moon to other people. <laughs> and so I think that it just shows the absurdity of the idea that, that somebody just claiming a piece of land grants them ownership in it. So I think what's probably a more appropriate way of establishing ownership is some combination of a land claim, you know, a, a survey, a boundary survey, and some kind of declaration of, of intent for how you're going to use that land. Uh, which you then follow through on by essentially homesteading it. And this is actually their, their principles about mining claims that, that are similar to these, these kinds of ideas. But so these two, these talking about homesteading and, and first claims as, as appropriate ways of acquiring land is all well and good, but none of it really matters because the way that almost every piece of land everywhere has actually come into ownership has been by seizure by governments, by conquerors, by, by some kind of governmental or, or, or aggressive organization over time. 
they're really, uh, to my knowledge, there are very, probably little or very few land titles that have been established primarily by homesteading or some more libertarian principle like a first claim. Everything at, one, everything at one point was once taken over by a government, and then from that point forward, they established what the, what the land, how the land was divided up. Um, they made the initial sale to the private property owner, and that's where we are today. I would also say that probably no future land titles on earth will ever be created by homesteading because all the land is now claimed by governments. I think there's some little slice of land in Antarctica where <laughs> no government has claimed it yet, but there's some treaty saying that, that nobody's allowed to claim it. So unless you're going to you know, the ocean floor or something, I think that the land we have is, and the land titles that we have are the ones we're going to have moving forward. So I say here, all existing land titles have been created by governments who have claimed unused land or seized occupied land. So what does that mean? Does that mean that all these land titles are invalid because they haven't come into ownership through you know, peaceful libertarian means? Well, I would say no. And, and um, I have a quote here from Stephen Kinsella um, has done some, uh, some good writing on this. Um, the point that he makes is that land claims are relative. So it's not that... If I have a land claim, I don't have to defend how that land claim came into existence. I just have to prove that nobody else has a better claim to that land than I do. So even if my piece of land was at some point taken over by some you know, conqueror in the 17th century, um, as long as there's nobody else who has a claim to that land that's, <laughs> that comes from before that time happened, then their claim is just as good as mine. And then it's between him and me who has the better claim in terms of who came first. Um, who homesteaded the land, who was using the land. There are some, some people out there, like if you've heard of mutualism or mutualists, market anarchists, um, anarcho-syndicalists, kind of on the, on the left end of the, of the anarchism spectrum, who claim that or make the, the assertion that all of these existing land titles, including private land titles, should be eliminated. That, you know, these, these, it was a little illegitimate how all these things came into ownership. Um, so we need to kind of go back to zero and, and eliminate these land titles and, you know, I don't know, give them to the working class or something. But again, I think that that's obviously practically unworkable. And I don't, I think in principle, um, we can argue that these existing land titles are perfectly valid on a relative basis. Now, what about public property? What about, uh, what about property that, that has been taken over by government and continues to be owned by government? Um, are those land titles invalid? Well, it's easy to answer because actually there is no public property. What we typically call public property is really just a form of private property that's owned by an organization called the government. So we can address public property in the same way that we address private property. Just like any private owner, um, the owner of, of public property, the government, sets rules for access. They can have fees and, and set different allowable uses. They're no different than any private property owner um, when we're thinking about public space. And obviously, some government-owned property is public space and some is not. So there's nothing special about a piece of land being owned by government that makes it more, any more likely to, be, to become public space or to be available as public space than private property. However, as we said, with, with private property, the land titles that governments own um, I think are valid. I don't think that we need to scrap, you know, say that all the roads should be unowned and that other people and organizations should go on and, and, and homestead all these existing roads. I think that we can take existing land titles that governments have established, let those be. The problem is not the fact that government owns these land titles. The problem is that government itself taxes and, and initiates force in other ways uh, to support and maintain their property. Um, so the problem is not the land titles themselves. The problem is the government. That's what needs to go away. We can, we can keep the land titles, transfer them to, to private ownership. Let's just get rid of government. So how do we do that? How do we divest government property to private ownership? Um, I'm going to talk generally about this, and then I want to talk about how we, how we can do this while preserving the rights people have to access this public space on what is now government property. First of all, let's talk about why would we want to divest public uh, government property? And uh, before we get into this, I use the word divestiture instead of privatization. It's, we're essentially talking about the same thing, but obviously when I'm talking about public space, um, the word privatization kind of has a bad connotation there. It's, it gets confusing for people where they think that if you're privatizing public space, then it's going to become only available for private access. So 
I'm using the word divestiture or divesting government property here, but it's essentially the same idea as, as privatizing. So why would we want to divest government property? Property ownership forms a part of the basis for the state's power and perceived legitimacy. So we have uh, all kinds of government-owned amenities like roads, parks, beaches, um, that are things that entice people to support government taxation and other government, government policies, government power. This is kind of like the idea of, of the Roman bread and circuses. And I make the argument here that, that people have this idea that government is collecting taxes to build infrastructure for them, when in reality, in reality, they're often taking that tax money and spending that money, blowing up infrastructure in other countries around the world. Another point here is that removing property from government ownership creates less justification for eminent domain. This is a, kind of a minor point, but it's, it's really important to some people who are directly affected by it, obviously. If government isn't building roads, they don't need to take more land to continue building roads. There are ways that other people have talked about ways that, that roads can be built and maintained privately without relying on eminent domain. When we start to think about uh, trying to move towards more of a voluntary society, kind of radically reducing the role of government, private land ownership becomes a big part of that. There's this idea that, that when you get to some kind of a, a stateless society, that private land ownership would really be the basis for establishing rules throughout that society. So you would have, we would replace what are now governmental rules with a whole kind of different tiers of, of authority and, and rule, rule setting. You could have landowners establishing rules for how people can, can behave on their property. You have deed restrictions that restrict how the landowners can use their property and to some extent what, what restrictions they can put on, on people who are coming onto their land. You would have broader kind of social standards or maybe industry standards that are established. And then there are universal morals like the non-aggression principle that, that hopefully would be an overarching kind of theory that would govern the way that, that people are behaving and setting rules at some of those lower levels. Another point here is that if we're trying to think about reducing, uh, reducing government services so that, again, those we can move to more of a voluntary society where, where all of the services that government now provides are provided within the private marketplace. If we think about one of the, the hardest nuts to crack there is municipal police. We have these police forces that claim a, a territorial monopoly over a certain area of land you know, within a city. And if we want that to uh, go away or at least become more of a private organization, one of the, one of the things we can do is to, to take all this private uh, public property, which these police are tasked with with patrolling, and if that public property all becomes privately owned, then those private landowners become responsible for, for securing their own property, you know, hiring their own security agents. That could be what are now municipal police, or it could be private security agencies. And then there's another thought here that, that property divestiture, if we start to, I'm going to, the next thing I'm going to talk about here is ways that, that public property can be owned, it can transfer to, to private ownership. And some of those forms of private ownership are what I would call public forms of private ownership. You have things like trusts, where a lot of people could be involved with um, or have a stake in ownership of these pieces of property. An interesting thought here is that if you can divest government property to more public forms of ownership, this could actually be a benefit for poor people. So this is this is funny situation where you could you could make an argument to kind of people on the right who ostensibly support privatization, you know, and, and less government involvement. But at the same time, you can make an argument to people on the left and say that, well, look, at if we take all, the, all these government assets, all this public property, and if those can become productive and profitable assets, that can create a basis of essentially income that, that if anybody has a right to, to claim kind of an ownership stake in, in owning these pieces of property, it can become a, a means of generating income for a lot of people who now don't have access to it. I'm going to move along here. I'm running out of time. I will be some, some time for questions, hopefully, at the end. So how can government property be divested? Well, one idea is that it could just it could be abandoned, as I said before, that governments say, okay, we're, we're done. You know, somebody else take over the roads, and then there's a process of homesteading, uh, all this existing government property. That, to me, seems pretty unworkable, other than maybe for unused land. There's an idea that Hans Hermann Hoppe and some other libertarians have talked about, which is this idea that that since taxpayers have paid for all of the improvements to build the roads and to, to build the public parks and all these things, that 
all this private public property should be either auctioned off or just or somehow returned to taxpayers and that the taxpayers should benefit from it, which is understandable. But I would argue that taxpayers are not the only victims of government, that they're, you know, they're just one class of people who government has affected. So why, why do they get a special benefit or special rights to to all these government assets um, if these things were to be privatized? There is this idea that, you know, you could have revolutionaries come in and, and seize all the government land and then somehow they would they would make it available uh, to everybody else. This is problematic to me, uh, um, obviously, that it really just cr- replaces one government with another government. And then it creates this, this kind of conflict over these pieces of land where they've been now taken over again by force. There's another thought that you could take existing government departments like your Parks and Rec Department and your the road, you know, the road department and spin those off as some kind of a private organization. This might actually be workable and might be, might be a reasonable thing um, as a way of kind of transitioning to more private ownership of, of public property. But there are problems there. Obviously there's a risk of, of monopoly, which we have now they're, they're all monopolies now, but I think there are, there are problems with having all that property just remain with one, with one organization. And then, of course, there's still a question of, well, then who owns this spun-off organization and who benefits from that? So I have this other idea I've been kind of spinning around in my head, which is this idea of what I'm calling opt-in trusts. So this is a a trust. First of all, there there are land trusts where a group of people get together and they take over, for example, let's say preservation of a certain area of land. So... Um, I just recently spent some time in England, and there they have this organization called the National Trust, um, which a lot of people have donated these this kind of estate properties to. There are a lot of natural areas as well. It's a huge organization. They own a ton of property within England, um, and it's all made available for, for public use and public access. So you can go into all these amazing kind of mansions that people have built over the years in England, all these historical places, and it's all, this is all a, a non-governmental kind of voluntary organization, and it works really well. So the idea there is that you could have some kind of trust. Uh, trust just means that a group of people get together and say, we're going to create this organization that's governed by a certain set of rules. And there are different ways that, that people can join that trust or, or, or leave and different benefits that they get from it. So my thought here is that you could have some kind of a trust where essentially anybody, since these are now, as people perceive them as being publicly owned assets, I think it's a good thing to try to maintain the possibility of public ownership, but at the same time, you don't want to force everybody into owning things that they don't want to own. Obviously, there are costs to maintaining roads and things, and some people might not want to take that on. Um, it's essentially an entrepreneurial adventure that everybody might not want to be involved in. So I'm calling this an um, opt-in trust where anybody could opt into to being involved with ownership of, maybe it's ownership of, of one park, of uh, a network of roads, or other, other pieces of public property. That could become an organization that could be set up and could be created. And then, you know, once, once uh, governments kind of come to the light of, of libertarianism, they could at least have these organizations in place that could be receivers of, of government property. So long way to get from here to there, but there's a thought here that there is a way possibly for these things to be owned, possibly in a public way. This is a quote here about this fear that people have about, about access to public space, that if you privatize all this public space, that everybody else will just be crammed out. There won't, there'll be nowhere for people to go. They'll be stuck on whatever piece of land they happen to be on. Um, so I want to talk about how we preserve access rights to public space. I would argue that existing public use of governments of, of what are now government owned spaces has been homesteaded as public space. So that this, this is something that we need to preserve things like roads and parks. Once a private owner takes over, I don't think they, they can just say that, okay, now we own it. We're going to say who gets to come in and who doesn't. I think that they need to preserve that as public space again, with some reasonable restrictions on how people use that space, like traffic laws, fees for use, hours of operations, things we talked about before. How do we enforce that? Uh, how, do we, how do we enforce public access and maintain those public access rights? As I said, some kind of trust organization, if these things are created as the owners of these public properties, there could be rules that govern how they operate that, that make sure that they preserve that as public space in perpetuity. Okay, this, the, the next line is essentially the same thing. There, it's, it's having these trust, these owners, ownership organizations that within their founding documents state that they're going to preserve, preserve the land as public access. Then you can also have deed covenants. So a deed covenant means that on the, the property deed that defines what the boundaries of the property are and who owns it, you could have a covenant or an easement on there that says that this, this land will be available to 
to the public for public use in perpetuity. And in that case, the, the private property owner does not have the right, at least on his own, to say that, to exclude people from that land. He would have to respect that easement in the property. Deed. There could be some means of getting some broad consensus for people to overturn that. But in general, a deed covenant could be a way to preserve public access to what are now public spaces. So just to summarize this, existing land titles that aren't in dispute should be respected. Government property should be divested to private ownership. Public forms of private ownership, I said this idea of opt-in trusts, may be the most viable way to do that. But when we do that, public access to what is now existing government property, government public space, should be preserved by some kind of, of legal right. I'll wrap up here because I think we're out of time, but I'll just say quickly the, the, the thought here of how this could impact cities as we get to more of a privately owned, voluntary society. In general, we're, we're talking about freeing what is now public space from the tragedy of the commons. So you have the tragedy of commons is this idea that when a lot of people use a piece of land, nobody really takes care of it because they're all just, just going in and, and using it the way they want to, and they don't really care about the long-term, the long-term preservation of that land. I would argue that private ownership of, of public land and private space can bring market efficiency, value discovery, and accountability to public space. So we realize you know, which roads are really the most worth, valuable, which parks are, are people using and enjoying. And accountability, this idea that, that the, public, the private property owners are accountable for what happens on their property. Right now, if you know, something happens on government property, let's say on a road, you can't sue the town for you know, having potholes in the road that cause you to get into, into a crash. Whereas with a private property owner, there could be some more accountability there. And similarly, I'll, I'll jump down here. That, would, that could mean that we have better management of road congestion, better policing of roads for, um, to reduce traffic accidents and improve safety. You could have enhancement of green spaces and urban plazas if private property owners try to attract people to their space. They could have events and, and other improvements to their spaces. Parking is, again, we keep talking about parking. Parking is another, another thing that, that could be appropriately provided. Right now, I think a lot of places we have too much parking. And so as private property owners, I think that parking would be provided more reasonably as, uh, by private owners. Mass transit, I think, could become more effective if we start to have more rational pricing of roads, uh, where we don't have, right now, everybody gets to ride on the roads for free to go everywhere. And I think that that could improve mass transit if, if we start to price that appropriately. And similarly, if you start to price roads appropriately, it starts to mitigate sprawl, which many people recognize as something that's unsustainable. Last slide here. With or without a state, the thoughtful divestiture of state property to private owners could enrich our cities and towns with a flourishing of public space. Tim, be sure to visit his lounge. Next up, we're going to have Tony Lekas talking about um, gun handling. <laughs>